the secrets of Stalin's war machine. May 1945, and Hitler's Reich has fallen. The conquering Red Army has marched into Berlin and ended the war in Europe. In Moscow, Josef Stalin celebrated this great victory in front of his own adoring people. Now he was the leader of a great nation, equal to the superpowers. No one could deny his place in history. Stalin was the, the man who triumphed in World War II. He won an empire. He finished World War II with the prestige of a world conqueror. Stalin was ready to take the credit for this great victory against fascism, but the cost was devastating to the Soviet people. Lives shattered, a decimated army, and 27 million war dead. The people did not win the war thanks to Stalin, but in spite of Stalin. This film reveals the real story behind Stalin's war with Hitler and how near he came to defeat. The Soviet Union's victory over Germany in the Second World War was paid for with heavy casualties. The 27 million Soviet war dead were nearly three times the number of dead in the whole of the First World War. Stalin led his country to this disaster, but then presented a very different picture to the world. He wanted to liquidate anybody who knew about his miserable failures in the war during 41 and 42. He wanted history to remember him as the great victor, not as the frightened politician who was scared as hell of Hitler. Stalin's first and crucial error was to underestimate Hitler's appetite for conquest. On the 22nd of June, 1941, three million German soldiers with 7,000 field guns and over 3,000 tanks lined up along the Soviet border, poised to invade. Stalin and the Red Army were caught completely off guard. Nobody can really believe that Stalin was not aware of German intentions, or that he would not believe the massive amount of intelligence information which he got. Even right down to the very day and hour when the German army was going to attack. But Stalin had ignored every warning that had crossed his desk. He had simply persuaded himself that Hitler was locked in battle with the British Empire, and he just would not attack the Soviet Union, another major power at the same time. Uh, I think that he just could not bring himself to believe it. So all this intelligence was simply treated as misinformation. Stalin paid heavily for this error of judgment. The Soviet losses during those early days in June 1941 were staggering. Hitler's blitzkrieg was sharp, effective and deadly. Most of the troops on the Western Front, especially in Belarus, had not been put on alert. So we lost more than a thousand airplanes on day one. This destruction in 1941 has to be blamed on Stalin alone. As the crisis mounted, the Soviet Politburo traveled to Stalin's dacha in Kuntsevo, on the outskirts of Moscow. They urgently needed Stalin to make some decisions. Normally, no one would drive out to the dacha without an order. The people from the Politburo showed up unexpectedly. When they entered the room, Stalin sat in an armchair and was deeply shocked. He literally jerked and asked, why did you come? He thought they'd come to arrest him. 
He realized, of course, at that time that it was all his fault. He was to blame for what had happened so far. That morning, Stalin went on the offensive. He turned to his generals. He says to the chief of staff, Zhukov, where are the armies? Has Minsk fallen? Is the road to Moscow open? Zhukov, toughest man in the Red Army, bursts into tears right there in front of him. And basically he says, we don't know. We've lost control of the armies. They're in free fall. We just don't know what's happening. At that moment, Stalin loses it. Already, Hitler's army was making swift progress through the Soviet Union. Hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers were captured by the enemy. The Red Army seemed powerless and leaderless in the face of the invasion. Stalin was completely shocked that he had got this so badly wrong. And there were others around who clearly realized he'd got it wrong. He didn't say so very loudly, of course, but they clearly realized that he had got it wrong. If Stalin didn't act soon and successfully, he would lose the war and his country. Stalin's military failures had begun well before the war with Hitler. Fearing a challenge to his power from the army, he had purged it of its leadership. By the end of the 1930s, 30,000 Soviet officers had been liquidated. From the walls of the Kremlin, Stalin looked out and everywhere he saw potential enemies, counter-revolutionaries, conspiracies. And I think we have to understand his purge of the army in terms of this e extraordinary, almost paranoid obsession that somehow or other there were enemies in Russia who were going to undermine the revolution. Thousands of the soldiers murdered during the purges were buried here in Butovo near Moscow. Even the army's commander-in-chief General Uborovicha was executed. His daughter remembers. The only thing I kept hoping for till the end was that somehow things would be resolved. I couldn't believe they just shot him. When the knock on the door came that day for General Uborovicha, his whole family was confronted. They said, take a suitcase for your daughter and for yourself. And I still recall vividly that my mother kept asking, where does the child go? They wouldn't tell her, only she won't die. And then they took them away in a little green car. And then they came to pick me up. It wasn't until 1956 that Vladimira was released from the prison camp. By then, she knew that both her parents had been shot on the orders of the Soviet secret police. While the Soviet army was in chaos, Adolf Hitler was focused and making his intentions very clear. First Austria, then the Sudetenland, and then Czechoslovakia fell to the Third Reich. At his Kuntsovo dacha, Stalin met with the Politburo. He knew he couldn't remain isolated from the impending war. Stalin knew that war would come with Hitler sooner or later. The West was not able to provide him any guarantees um, or security in this way. He realized he was going to have to make a pact to delay the war. In 1939, negotiations with Britain and France turned out to be unproductive, so Stalin decided to meet with Hitler's representatives. He invited Hitler's foreign minister, von Ribbentrop, to Moscow. When we saw the pictures of von Ribbentrop arriving at Moscow airport, with alternating flags displaying hammer and sickle and swastika, and all that celebration, we realized immediately that this was a turning point in the history of Soviet politics. While visiting the Kremlin, von Ribbentrop caused a stir. The entire Politburo was standing in front of von Ribbentrop, when all of a sudden he shouted, Heil Hitler. They all held their breath. What would happen now? It was no joke to salute Stalin with Heil Hitler. 
But Stalin reacted in an absolutely unusual and astounding manner. He grabbed the tail of his long jacket, took a bow and curtsied. There was an enormous burst of laughter. The negotiations resulted in the Hitler-Stalin Pact, parts of which were to remain secret. When Stalin made the pact with Hitler in 1939, I think many people found it in, 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 almost incredible. How could they have made a pact, these two ideological enemies? But I think Stalin always saw Hitler, in some senses, like him, distinct from the other run-of-the-mill Western liberal politicians. Both they and the countries they led were outside the rest of the world, able to change the world in ways which other people were unwilling to do. And I think that for a moment, Stalin perhaps thought that he and Hitler could do this thing together. They could change the world, the two of them. But Hitler was pulling all the strings. At his residence in Obersalzburg, he was heard to say, everything I do is directed against Russia. If the West is too blind to see that, I will come to an understanding with the Russians, defeat the West, and then gather all my forces to turn towards the Soviet Union. But Poland was the first casualty of the pact. On the 1st of September, 1939, the German army invaded. Within a few days, Britain and France declared war on Germany, and the Second World War had started. Hitler and Stalin had agreed in a secret part of their pact to carve up Poland between them. It was an easy victory for the Red Army to march into the already devastated country. As the Nazis and the Soviets met, Stalin made sure the Polish nation wouldn't be able to fight back. The Russians arrested about 40,000 Polish officers, the cream of the Polish army and police, kept them in camps, and in 1940, Stalin decided that they should be destroyed, exterminated. The Polish wives and families saw their men taken away. Edward. My husband, Edward, kissed our son, Andrzejek, kissed little Jaku, whom I held in my arms, and then he kissed me. He bid us farewell and never returned. Only later did Janina Kremki learn what had happened to her husband from a newspaper article. In the camps of Ostakovo, Starobielsk and Katyn, 20,000 Polish officers were murdered, shot by Soviet soldiers. If I only think how two NKVD men held them and a third one stood behind and shot, it seems to me like I can hear that shot, see it happen, how they died in this way. Later, Stalin accused Hitler of having committed the massacre, but the order to kill clearly bears Stalin's mark. Now Stalin the warlord was beginning to get into his stride. In order to secure his borders, his next victim was the neighboring nation, Finland. This should have been an easy victory, but the Finnish troops fought hard and killed 200,000 Soviet soldiers. The bloodshed was horrific. We had enormous losses. There's a mass military grave in central Karelia, 10 meters by 10 meters, where half the division is buried. Pictures like these stayed hidden from the Soviet people they were told only of the victory, not the bloodshed. Stalin praised this so-called victory on this tiny front as a symbol of triumph in any war, any future conflict with the imperialist enemy. Today we know, of course, that it wasn't a victory, 
but the worst defeat in the history of the Red Army. In the summer of 1940, Hitler's forces had conquered much of Europe. After the fall of France, Hitler was at the apex of his power. Stalin was deeply afraid of Hitler because his entire calculation collapsed, which had been based on the assumption that Hitler would get bogged down on the Western Front. At this point, Stalin made his next error of judgment. He kept faith in his pact with Hitler and refused to see that Hitler was playing his own game, ready to abandon the pact at any time. Stalin ignored the threat. He truly believed what Hitler said, and that was one of his most severe and most absurd political mistakes, for which our country and our people had to pay very dearly. Fresh military intelligence from Germany was arriving in Moscow. Hitler was sure to abandon the pact and attack the Soviet Union. Stalin refused to believe the information. Stalin never trusted intelligence. Having been a double or treble agent himself with the Tsarist secret police, he distrusted all intelligence reports by their very nature. But more than that, he just couldn't bring himself to believe that he'd got it wrong. And the more he insisted war wasn't coming, the more deluded he became. He used to say, doesn't Hitler realize that Russia isn't like France or England? It's worth five or six of those. And if Hitler never did grasp that, and of course it was Stalin's biggest mistake in his career. Hitler wasn't afraid of Stalin or the Soviet Union. He gathered his three million troops on the Soviet border and at dawn on June the 22nd, 1941, broke through the Red Army defenses. Stalin had badly misjudged the threat from Hitler. He left Moscow and laid low in his dacha. The humiliation of getting everything so wrong catches up with him. He loses his confidence and he actually says, we've screwed up. Lenin left us a state and we've destroyed it. He drives out to his dacha at Kuntsevo and for three days he stays there. He won't answer any phone calls. Um, he won't give any orders. He won't see anybody. And it's basically, he's having a sort of nervous breakdown. But his top people around him actually believe he's also playing to the gallery a little bit. And of course they're right, because in fact Stalin is testing them. Um, and he's also saying to them, if you want to handle the war, you can do it better than me, by all means. But if you can't, come and reappoint me, come and re-elect me, and make me the supremo. And after three days, they come on bended knee, and they beg him to come back as Minister of Defense, Supreme Commander-in-Chief, the one and only Stalin. And then Stalin staged his comeback. At last, he had done something right. He had persuaded his generals to back him. Now, all he needed was the support of the people. When Stalin finally spoke to the Soviet people, it was an extraordinarily important moment. I think a great many people had wondered what had happened to him. They wanted to hear from him. He was the father of the Soviet people, of the revolution. And suddenly here he was speaking to them again. And I think it had an extraordinary impact on a great many uh, Soviet citizens. At last they felt, here he is, he's back, he's in control, perhaps we'll win. The people got into the trenches and shouted, for the fatherland, for Stalin. As the Soviet people rallied behind Stalin, he was faced with the true scale of his military disasters. The whole country was at risk as the German forces advanced towards Moscow. If Moscow fell, the country would likely follow. As Hitler's army fought triumphantly towards Moscow, Stalin had shown himself wanting as a military leader. He did, though, have one enormous advantage over Hitler, massive reserves of manpower. 
throughout the winter of 1941, the Soviet troops suffered huge losses. Like Hitler, Stalin saw this in terms of the historical process, that deaths were a necessary cost so that the revolution could be achieved or uh, the world proletariat could be freed. In, in that sense, he simply detached himself from human feeling. He was an instrument of history. He was not any longer a real human being. The Russians suffered heavy losses. As soldiers, we often watched huge waves of attackers just being gunned down. I would say, for every German casualty, there were 10 on the Russian side. Their officers ran behind them, and when the troops did not advance, their own officers would shoot them from behind. Those who surrendered were considered traitors by their warlord. Those found wanting in the spirit of sacrifice faced court-martial. Vladlen and Kishkin watched while a soldier tried to explain why he'd been missing. He had been stripped of his epaulets and collar patches and was digging a hole. I didn't understand what this meant. This man said, guys, I got lost. We're in the woods after all. I've been fighting and I will continue to fight. They told him, in the name of the presidency of the Supreme Soviet, you are a deserter. He had to stand facing the pit, and then I saw someone shooting him in the neck with a pistol. And I saw him falling backwards. It was horrifying to me. I absolutely could not understand why they did that, because when the boy told his story, it was like a confession in church. It was evident that he was truly lost. Not a day passed without executions of so-called enemies of the people, alleged cowards, deserters, traitors. All this was done on Stalin's order. Nobody was allowed to discuss it or correct it, and thus masses of Soviet officers and enlisted men were killed. Despite the massive human sacrifice by the Red Army, Hitler's troops continued their relentless march towards Moscow. During the advance, Stalin's own son from his first marriage, Yakov Zugashvili, was captured and interrogated. Rolf Paul was there. The vernehmung was schon im Gang. The interrogation was already underway, and the Major asked Yakov Zhugashvili, what do you think about the progress we made during the past four weeks? Now we're going to march into Moscow? At that point, Stalin smiled and shook his head. You are never going to enter Moscow, he said. My father made sure all the houses are booby-trapped and you will never enter the city. And the Major replied, we'll see about that. But the truth was, Moscow was in critical danger. The German army was just 30 kilometers from the Kremlin. The mass of the Russian army had already been destroyed and that the advance on Moscow was basically a matter of marching speed and not of enemy resistance, since there was no more enemy between us and Moscow. We really believed the war was over. Fearing the worst, that Moscow would fall, 1,000 kilometers east of the capital, a secret subterranean bunker was built. It was to be the emergency seat of government. Stalin's only plan was one of retreat. His actions appeared like those of a man in panic, clutching at straws, looking for help from the most unlikely places. One of his decisions started, bizarrely, with a dream. A priest told Stalin about a dream he had. 
An angel had appeared and thanked Stalin for not leaving Moscow. But he would also have to carry the icon of the Virgin Mary three times around the city. That would stop the Germans. Stalin used an aeroplane. He ordered it to circle above Moscow with its unusual cargo, an icon of the Holy Virgin of Tikvin, the patron saint of the Russian soldiers. The tyrant who had ordered the destruction of the church and its priests now called upon their support. The churches were allowed to open their doors again, and with Stalin's blessing, the Patriarch of Moscow made this plea. By way of thanks for its support, Stalin gave the church a major concession. 21 On the 21st of October, Stalin told the priest Sergei, we will get everybody back who is still alive. If there were any priests in the camps who died after 1941, they were the forgotten ones, those who they really could not find. The winter of 1941 saw Stalin's first success in the war. His top general, Zhukov, persuaded him to withdraw his troops from Siberia and bring them in to defend Moscow. It was a masterstroke. Moscow was saved, and Hitler no longer appeared invincible. Stalin's role in the uh, Battle of Moscow was very important, not because he understood the strategy, because in the end, this was the first major battle in which he relied on that great Soviet commander, General Zhukov. What was important was Stalin's decision that he would stay in the capital, with the German army only a matter of kilometers away. And I think this was an extraordinarily dramatic and important moment in the war. Moscow was safe, but Leningrad, the historic capital city of Russia under the Tsars, had been under siege by the German army since September 1941. Stalin showed his ruthlessness here. He could have evacuated the city, but he wanted every citizen to make the ultimate sacrifice for the Soviet state. The people of Leningrad stayed under constant fire from the Germans. For a while there was shooting, and then there was silence. Why? The Germans shouted something inconceivable, which I hesitate to repeat here. They called, you are going to die one way or another. The city is going to die. Leningrad became a symbol for the suffering of the civilian population. The first ones to die were the children and the old people. They said my little brother Yurik had died and shouted, get the sled from home and pick him up. I didn't know how to tell my mother. The 11-year-old Ludmila had to bury her own younger brother. A truck loaded with dead bodies, just like they used to transport lumber. They were not sewn into a cloth, but lay there the way they had been picked up from the street. They were dumped into a pit. For a long time, I stood there and watched. One of the volunteer helpers approached me and asked, why are you standing here, girl? I am waiting, I replied, for the pit to fill up so he can put the boy on top. Otherwise, it will be too heavy on him. The siege of Leningrad lasted for 900 days and over one million civilians died. The memories have remained vivid.
It was fear and a terrible hatred. I was still a child, but the hatred I felt was so strong that I don't know what I would have done to them. In the spring of 1942, the German army was back on the move. This time their target was Stalingrad and the oil wells of the Caucasus. There was no doubt what was at stake. Stalin sent for me and said, Comrade Babakov, if the Germans capture the oil fields, I'm going to have you shot. But if the oil fields burn down and the Germans do not come, and if we are without fuel as a result, then I will also have you shot. Hitler demanded that Stalingrad fall. Stalin insisted that Stalingrad did not fall, even though the Red Army was fighting ferociously, hand to hand, on the banks of the Volga, li almost literally clinging on. So it was an amazing um, human duel, and the duel between these two dictators of supreme and ruthless will. So both of them knew it was a turning point. The key moment of the battle for Stalingrad came as the Germans were pouring their forces into the center of the city. Stalin was in conference with his generals. He noticed that Marshal Zhukov and, General, and, and Vasilevsky, two of his top generals, are whispering. And with very good um, hearing, Stalin's senses were always terrifyingly acute. He said, I can hear you're talking about something, and I can hear you're talking about how to solve Stalingrad. And he said, come back tomorrow morning and give me the plan of how we will surround the German forces. And they come back the next morning with this plan, and Stalin says, fine. No one is to know about this except you and us two, and you two and me. And, you know, and, and set about it, do it. Stalingrad is saved, the ultimate turning point in the Second World War, but also the moment when Stalin becomes an efficient and competent supreme commander. Stalin made sure that the generals kept the secret. It would always look as if it was Stalin's plan that saved Stalingrad. In fact, the generals were now in control. He only confirmed their decisions. Only on occasion, when he meddled with their business, things would turn bad. When the Germans surrendered at Stalingrad, Field Marshal von Paulus was taken prisoner. A plan was suggested to exchange von Paulus for Stalin's captured son, Yakov. Stalin showed his characteristic ruthlessness. When Stalin heard the proposal to save Yakov from captivity and let Paulus go in return, he thought about it for a while and then decided he would not swap a general for one of our junior officers. Stalin had never forgiven his son for surrendering to the Germans in the early days of Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union. The prisoner exchange did not happen, and Yakov died in 1943 at the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. I'm often asked whether I hate Stalin for not bartering my father for Field Marshal Paulus. Well, I certainly would have had a better life if my father had been alive. But I usually reply that Stalin had no choice. Stalin was, after all, the man of steel. This man of steel was quick to exploit the defeat of Hitler at Stalingrad by parading the captured German prisoners through the streets of Moscow. I was in Moscow at the time, even in Gorky Street, which is downtown, and that's where they came past. I didn't watch it. I had a bad feeling about it, too. Fighting fascism was one thing, but parading German officers and servicemen through the capital, I did not go to watch that. Forty thousand prisoners of war were put on display by Stalin. <laughs> 
And I went to the Red Square with a friend of mine whose husband was killed in the war at the front. And we stood and saw these animals, as we thought. And we saw wretched human beings. They weren't even red-haired, as we thought, you know, Fritzes. They were normal, wretched people going on and on and on. And, my, and I felt terrible, but I didn't want to say that to my friend because her husband was killed. And she turned to me and said, I feel no hatred. Stalin didn't hold back. Total humiliation by the victor of the vanquished. Well, that's, that's what any Caesar would do. It's the, the thing to be done. The victor and the victims. And to, yes, to, to humiliate. And to give vent to people's uh, rage. It had taken Stalin years of intense war with Hitler to learn the craft of a warlord. Now he had to learn to reap the benefits of victory. As the war slowly turned in Stalin's favor, the Soviet leader began to look to the future. As well as war leader, he now needed to be chief diplomat. Winston Churchill visited Stalin several times. The relationship was difficult at the start. Well, he didn't really care for him very much and didn't trust him. But naturally, it could not upset him. But after the first meeting in the Kremlin, he was saying what he thought of Stalin, this rude, evil man. And um, the British ambassador said, Prime Minister, I must remind you that this office will be bugged like everywhere else in the Kremlin. And that didn't have much effect on him, but he watered it down a bit. Churchill's blunt words had their effect. Next day, when Winston went to see Stalin, he was so charming, because um, he'd had a transcript of what Winston said about him, this evil man. Um, and um, he said to Winston, don't go back today. He said, I'd like you to stay another day or two, and I've arranged a banquet in the Kremlin for you and your staff. Churchill had always opposed Soviet communism, but now said he was happy to work with the devil if it helped defeat fascism. Well, I think he was a great enough man to think, you know, which is the best for Europe. And, um, you know, if we cooperate, and we may not like them very much, but we will do so. And for Stalin, Churchill might not be the devil, but he was certainly an ideological enemy. Churchill was quite clearly a representative of this capitalist imperialist system that Bolshevism detested, but Stalin couldn't help liking Churchill as a personality. He was forceful, he knew what he wanted, he wouldn't brook criticism. In some ways, there were some curious similarities between the two men. The Soviets received enormous amounts of military hardware from the United States and Britain, supplies that would make a decisive difference. But Stalin wanted more from his Western allies. He wanted a second front. It's part of different philosophies. For Stalin, victims didn't count. His own people didn't count. They were just statistics. And of course, neither the Americans or the English want to lose more people than they had to. That's partly why they lingered with the Second Front. They didn't, they wouldn't just use anything to win. They had to win their way. Although the Allies delayed opening a Second Front, every day and every night, British and American bombers pounded German cities. Churchill argued that the bombing offensive would destroy German industry and help the Red Army in its advance. The second front on land was not opened until June 1944, D-Day, the Normandy invasion. <laughs> 
It was the beginning of the end for Hitler, and the Allies now began to make plans for the post-war era. In February 1945, the future victors met at the Tsar's Livadia Palace in Yalta, in the Crimea, at a conference hosted by Stalin. Both Churchill and Stalin tried to woo President Roosevelt. Stalin and Churchill were fighting for Roosevelt's soul. And the fight went even in the placements, where should Roosevelt be? Stalin wanted to be near him. And it seems that Stalin won. With Nazi Germany on the brink of collapse, Stalin pressed for control over Eastern Europe. The Allies gave in to him, and Stalin made considerable gains. It was a point at which he quite clearly emerged in some ways as a senior partner. Roosevelt was ill, Churchill too was tired and, and knew he was facing all kinds of problems at home. Um, Stalin arrived more or less knowing what he wanted, um, uh, at the head of a Red Army that had destroyed German forces in Europe. And I think, I think that he came here in some sense as the, as the real victor of the war. In April 1945, the Red Army launched its final offensive against Berlin. Stalin was keen that his soldiers, and not the Western Allies, should get there first. He wanted to go down in history as the man who defeated Hitler. It was important for him to reach Berlin before General Eisenhower, especially since there was no resistance in the approach from the Western Front. But right to the end, Stalin was up to his old tricks. He gave identical orders to two of his generals, Zhukov and Konyev. They both raced to capture Berlin, regardless of cost to their own soldiers. It was unavoidable under these circumstances, when Zhukov and Konyev attacked at the same time, that there was some crossover, and it wasn't always clear who was friend and who was foe. As a result, there were huge Soviet losses right up to the end. He let tens of thousands die in senseless attacks just to take Berlin in time. Hundreds of thousands of lives were sacrificed. Behind the lines, tens of thousands of civilians became victims to the advancing army. Stalin had only vengeance for the German people. Of course, it was drummed into our heads by our propaganda. Whenever you meet a German, kill him. During the advance on Berlin, the behavior of the conquering Soviet troops stirred up hatred and fear. The political line changed in April, when Soviet troops were ordered to behave properly in Berlin. They really meant it. But of course, the order came much too late. In May 1945, the Soviet army reached its goal, Berlin. Hitler was dead, and the war in Europe was over. In Hitler's bunker in the destroyed chancellery of the Reich, a body was found. It was Hitler but nobody was to know. Under no circumstances was Hitler's death to be publicized. That was Stalin's explicit order. For this reason, no photographers, no press, no film crews were present when the body was discovered. Absolutely nobody. It was to remain top secret. Stalin kept his secret from the Allies, even at the Potsdam Conference in July 1945. 
When he arrived in Potsdam, the first question that Churchill and Truman asked was, did you find Hitler's body? And he replied, no. Maybe he believed, as long as there were rumors that Hitler could still be alive somewhere, the anti-Hitler coalition would stick together. He was now uh, bathed in the, in, in the um, reverence, um, uh, uh, bathed in the prestige of being the world conqueror that he'd become. This boy from Georgia, this cobbler's son, this boy who'd been beaten by his mother and his father, who'd overcome immense obstacles just by will and by killing massive amounts of people who turned Russia into a superpower. This was the man who now took the bow, if you like, on the world stage um, in his generalissimo's white uniform with his huge shoulder boards. He himself said, I look like a bandmaster or a doorman. He said, I regret wearing the uniform. But in fact, there he was. He loved it. And it was his big bow on the stage of world history. Stalin had nearly lost the war for the Soviet Union, but now he emerged as one of the great victors of the war, respected by the Allies and loved by his people. Just take a look at Russia today. Who is the hero? The hero is Stalin. Even Democrats in Russia would tell you, sure, Stalin had tens of millions of people killed, but he turned Russia into a superpower. The coalition that had won the war would be short-lived. Once the world had been divided up around the Potsdam conference table, the pressures between the United States and the Soviet Union would lead to the years of the Cold War. Two superpowers locked in an uneasy peace. In his 25-year reign, Stalin had turned the Soviet Union into a mighty industrial superpower, able to take on and defeat the vast German war machine but his success came only at great cost. Stalin remains an extraordinary figure, a bundle of contradictions. On one hand, one of the most successful, triumphant, imperialist autocrats of all time. On the other hand, the cost was totally unacceptable. He was a mass murderer who killed his own people in numbers that were unimaginable. And so he must rank ultimately one of the most successful and one of the most repellently grotesque rulers of all history. And for more about Stalin, go to channel4.com slash history. And next week, we're muckraking into our past. Details coming up. Now, next on four, Robert De Niro and the late Marlon Brando star in the network premiere of The Score.